Good evening. This is a part of Holy Week tonight. In fact, this Wednesday evening is actually the beginning of the Jewish Passover. This was the time of year when Jesus came into Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. And that week would end with shouts of crucify him, where our Lord went to the cross for our sins and rose again on Easter Sunday morning as King of Kings, the victor over death, hell, and the grave. As a part of our Holy Week celebration this week, I wanted to share with you a teaching on what the cross means to me. One of the most important things we can study in the Bible is the cross of Christ and what it really means to us spiritually. History has been marked by great discoveries of incredible mysteries. Think, for example, the mystery of creation. Scientists date the beginning of the universe 13.8 billion years ago at what has been called the Big Bang. Suddenly, instantaneously, without any explanation to this day, matter exploded both in space and one scientist says all of space exploded simultaneously and all the matter in the universe of this vast universe was created in one instantaneous moment. Scientists can observe amazing things about the universe, but no one knows why instantaneously the universe began. It is a scientific mystery. Consider the mystery of dark matter. Dark matter was first observed and the theory put forth in 1922. Scientists cannot see dark matter. It comprises 26% of all matter, and yet it cannot be observed. But scientifically, we know it exists because of the way it interacts with matter. It's a reality, but it's a mystery no scientist understands. And consider the discovery of human DNA and its structure in 1959 by two scientists when they first could see that it was constructed of two helix that were interwoven. We've begun now to understand how those amazing human chromosomes exist and interact. Scientists at that time in 1959 call it the secret of life. They had discovered a mystery a mystery that still holds us in wonder. And just as there are scientific mysteries, there are spiritual mysteries. And the greatest of all mysteries is the mystery of the cross of Christ. Now, the incarnation of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, how God entered the world in human form is a great mystery. In fact, Paul calls it that in 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. But I think the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross is even a greater spiritual mystery. In fact, Paul the Apostle in Corinthians called it a stumbling block, a stumbling stone. Many people just stumble over it intellectually, trying to understand why the cross was necessary. Why did God choose the cross as the means by which he would atone for the sins of the world? We know the crucifixion happened. We know the grave of Jesus was empty. But why did it all happen? So tonight I want you to think with me about the spiritual mystery of the cross and what the cross means to each one of us personally. Now, when Jesus spoke of the cross, he said in Mark 10 and 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So he spoke of the necessity of the cross. The Apostle Paul spoke of the power of the cross. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 23. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved... It is the power of God. And the apostle Peter said that the cross was preordained before the creation began. Before the Big Bang of 13.8 billion years ago, God decided to put a cross on Golgotha's brow. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, Peter says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the creation 
of the world. So what does the cross mean to us today as disciples of Jesus Christ? Well, let me take you to one passage that I want to explain and expound tonight to you as we study the word together. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it begins with the statement, I am crucified with Christ. So what the cross means to me is that I have been crucified with him. What in the world does that mean? Now, some people kind of make this a negative description of the Christian life or living the crucified life. But remember, three days after the crucifixion, there was a resurrection. We're living a resurrected life. So what does it mean I am crucified with Christ? It means that I have put my faith in Jesus' death on the cross as the sufficient payment for my sins. He took my judgment and he offers me the free gift of righteousness and eternal life. And I receive what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient for my sins. So I'm not trying to work my way to heaven anymore. That's what it means. I am crucified with him. I've accepted his death on the cross as the payment for all of my sins, as the atonement, the covering for my sins. I am accepting what he did at the cross as my eternal salvation. There's a Christian song that sings, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. All the debt of my sin and your sin, Jesus paid it at the cross, at Calvary. And we've accepted that by faith. And that's what it means, I am crucified with Christ. Now, we can apply this in a couple of areas. It means that because when you're crucified, you've died. And yet when you're dead to something, it means you're not responsive to it anymore. You're not controlled by it anymore. So there are a couple of points that are made throughout the scripture about what it means that the crucifixion has been applied to us. We're living a crucified life in the sense that we've accepted his crucifixion is sufficient for our salvation. First of all, it means that we have died to sin, that we've died to the rule or the controlling principle of sin. All of us still have the capacity to sin now that we're born again, but we're not controlled by it. We're not governed by it. That's not our main motive in life, to sin. We want to live a righteous life. Even though we're still vulnerable, we still have spiritual weaknesses, but now that we're born again, we have a new desire to live for Christ. Romans 6 and 4 says, Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. Nels Fair, a theologian in his book, Christ and the Christian, says that the church... The church is the fellowship of those who are dead to themselves but alive to God. I'm crucified with Christ. I've died to sin. Sin doesn't control me. It's not my master. It's not my ruler. It's not the governing principle of my life or yours so that I can live for God's glory. Listen how Paul uses this crucified with Christ in the sense of being dead to the control of sin. In Galatians 5, 24, he says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus, they've crucified the sinful nature, the flesh, with its passions and desires. In Galatians 6 and 4, he says, God forbid that I glory except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which I have been crucified in the world, and the world has been crucified in me, that the, the values of this present fallen world system don't control my life. They don't govern my life. I don't live my life by the standards of the world. I live it by the standards of Christ. So when he says, I'm crucified with Christ, I believe in what Jesus did on the cross as sufficient to pay for my sins, but it also means that now I have died to the force, the control of sin. I'm no longer responsive and governed by it. But it also means that we're dead to self-righteousness. Many people try to make themselves righteous with God, and they're trying to earn their way to heaven. But I've died to that whole notion. That's not controlling me anymore. In fact, he says in Galatians 2.21, listen to the very next statement after this verse we're studying tonight, Galatians 2.20. Listen to verse twenty. One. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God because if righteousness could be obtained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In Galatians 2 verse 19, he says, I died to the law. In other words, trying to make ourselves righteous before God by keeping the Ten Commandments or any of the other laws of God. We've died to that whole notion because we realize 
we're not good enough to keep the law anyway. We've all broken the law of God. That we're not trying to make ourselves righteous by keeping the law. Romans 10 verse 4 says, Christ is the end of the law. Right where you are watching me, I want you just to say that. Christ is the end of the law. I want you to feel the impact of that. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness to all who believe. That is all who believe in Jesus. Christ is the end of the ceremonies of the Old Testament law. He's, into the, he's the end of the condemnation law because the law reveals our sins. It condemns us as guilty. He's the end of that condemnation. He's the end of the celebration of the law. That the law doesn't save us. It was never given to save us. Romans 3 and 20 says, By keeping the law shall no one be justified before God. That was not the purpose of the law. The law was given to reveal our sin and to lead us to Christ as our Savior. So what the cross means to me, and what the cross means to you is, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead to sin. It doesn't control me. It's not my master. I've been set free from that. I now want to live for God. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to self-righteousness. I'm crucified any notion that I have to earn my way to heaven. I'm crucified with Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I, the old me, no longer lives, but I do live. Christ lives in me. So we don't really live a crucified life. We live a resurrected life. It's pretty negative to say you live a crucified life, but it's very positive to say I live a resurrected life. Resurrection means a new beginning, new hope, life, not death. Shakespeare in Macbeth writes, what is life? Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And many people feel that way. Life is hopeless. It's meaningless. It's pointless. People that live without hope and without God in their lives. But when you meet Jesus, you have a resurrected life. You're born again. Life is the main message that Jesus ever proclaimed. He came, said he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly in John 10 verse 10. When John the apostle begins to write his gospel about Jesus coming to the world, he says of him in John 1 verse 4, in him, in Jesus was life and his life was the light of all men. And if you'll receive Jesus into your life, your physical life, you'll have spiritual life. You see, there's more than physical life. Life is more than biological processes. It's more than our hearts beating. It's more than our lungs breathing. It's more than our brains giving electrical impulses to the nervous system. That's physical life. But you know, you can be physically alive and spiritually dead. And that's what sin does. It kills the human spirit, makes us insensitive to God. But when Christ enters your life, and the Holy Spirit enters your life. You're born again. You're resurrected. You come out of the grave of sin to walk in newness of life, Romans 6 verse 4 says. What does the cross mean to me? It means I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead to sin as my controlling master. Christ is my Lord. I live for God. It means I've died to the law and self-righteousness. I don't try to make myself right with God because I've been made right with God through Jesus Christ. It means that Christ lives in me. You see, the Christian life is not a negative, it's a positive. The Christian life is not subtraction, it's addition. The Christian life is not division, it's multiplication. When you have Christ in your life, you are going to live the most excellent life possible. Everything in your life will rise to a better, higher standard. Jesus is your life, and he will bring life, the fullness of life in every area of your personal life as you serve him. I'm crucified with Christ. Christ lives in me. But now third of all, he says, the life that I live in the body, I live it by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith. That's what the cross means. By faith. Say those words. By faith. You see, those two words are the watch words of the Christian life. You see them all through the scripture. Even in the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2.4, the prophet of God said, The righteous shall live by faith. Now, Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous shall live by faith. Ephesians 2, verse 8 says, You're saved by grace through faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. We're dealing with a health crisis right now, the coronavirus. 
We're dealing with a problem we've never faced in our lives. You say, how are we going to get through it? By faith, not by fear, not by worry, not by anger, not by doubt, not by depression, by faith. I live by faith in two things, in the person of Jesus, the Son of God, and in the passion of Jesus on the cross who gave himself for me. To be a Christian is to simply say, I live by faith in the Son of God. Did you know that Jesus is called the Son of God 49 times in the New Testament? What he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They say, well, some say you're Jeremiah or Elijah, one of the prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the Christian confession. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And I believe that Jesus is Lord. A Christian is simply a person who puts their personal faith in Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. And I pray that you have done that. And if not, you can do it tonight and open your heart to Christ. I live by faith. I face my problems by faith. I face my challenges by faith. I pursue my goals by faith. The cross means that I now live by faith, not by fear, by faith. In who Jesus is, the Son of God. Many, many religious leaders, many people have claimed to be prophets, philosophers, teachers of divinity, but only one person ever claimed to be the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I live by faith in His passion. His sufferings on the cross. Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And I, I believe, and I want you to believe, Jesus loves you. That's what I have faith in. Regardless of how good I am or bad I am, or regardless of my successes and failures, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and does love me. And he loves you. And he gave himself for me. Jesus died on the cross for me. See, I'm a Christian not because Jesus died for the whole world and everybody sins. I'm a Christian because Jesus died for my sins. When I put my faith in Jesus as an eight-year-old boy at the end of a worship service in the church we attended, a small church, I was the only person who responded to the altar call the evangelist gave. I understood that night that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And you say, well, you're only eight years old. What kind of sins have you committed? Well, none of any kind of importance, but it's the point is that we're born in sin. We have a sin nature. I understood that as a kid. I understood that I needed a Savior. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me enough to go to that cross for me and gave himself for me. And I want you to know that Jesus died for your sins. He came to this world for your eternal salvation. Several years ago, the Vietnam Wall was on tour through the United States. And this wall has the names of men and women who fought in that war who never returned from combat. It's a wall of remembrance. And when that wall was displayed in Chicago, the people came from all over to see it. And one man had traveled a long distance and was standing there and news reporters were all around. And she noticed him standing there and she went up and talked to him about what the wall meant to him, and he said that he had fought in that war. He pointed to one name on the wall. He said, I wanted to come and see this wall and want to see if that one name was there. And he pointed with tears in his eyes, tears in his eyes. He said, this man gave his life for me. Well, that's what Holy Week is about. Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And I pray that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that you'll put your faith in Him, receive Him as your Savior, trust Him as your Lord. You'll be born again. You'll have this resurrection life, real life, spiritual life. You'll live the most amazing life you ever dreamed possible when you confess Jesus as your Savior. And for those of you that are watching me, you're believers, your followers of Jesus like I am. Let's remember his passions this week. Let's remember his sufferings. 
Let's remember what makes our faith special. We're not just following a teacher or a wise man. We're following the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Join me in prayer now. If you'd like to know Christ as your Savior, pray with me now. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you're the Son of God. I confess my sins to you. I repent of my sins and I receive your forgiveness. I receive you now as my Savior and I openly confess you as my Lord. And Lord Jesus, with so many believers that are sharing the word with me tonight, we pause to praise you and to remember you and your sufferings. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and thank you that you gave yourself on the cross for our sins. And we worship you as King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you for joining me tonight for this time in the Word. If you've accepted Christ tonight, I also want to encourage you to go online. You can get my book, Fresh Start, that I've written just as a free gift for you. You can go to the website and get that. Email me here at the church. You can also get it online, electronic version. Thank you for your generous financial support of the church. I know right now as we are going through this virus and we're all at our own homes, we are still the church. Even though we're not gathered here, we are gathered in our homes and we are still the Mount Parent family. Your tithes and offerings right now are so important to keep our church strong spiritually. We'll come through this storm soon. We'll come through this season. We'll all be back together. So I want to thank you and commend you for your faithful giving. It is needed and deeply appreciated. Please know that I'm praying for your healing, your safety, and your blessing. And I know that God is going to bless you abundantly.